another Real Estate Guys radio program. I'm your host, Robert Helms. As you build your real estate portfolio, you need to understand the legal side of the business. Today, we'll talk about the legal protections you need as a real estate investor, and we'll give you an update for some changes happening in the law for 2021. And we've got a great guest today on the Real Estate Guys radio program. Hear ye, hear ye. Registration is now open for the Real Estate Guys 19th Annual Investor Summit. Imagine spending an entire week with like-minded investors, world-class educators, and real-world professionals. Returning this year, our sales legend Tom Hopkins, the editor of the Gold Newsletter Brian London, international real estate developer Beth Clifford, and Jim Rohn's 18-year business partner Kyle Wilson. And joining us live and in person for his 9th Investor Summit, Peter Schiff. Plus, returning for his ninth Investor Summit, best-selling author and the Rich Dad Advisor for Real Estate, Ken McElroy. Plus, lots more to be announced. It all begins June 11th in beautiful Belize. Visit realestateguysradio.com and click the tab that says Summit to reserve your spot. This transformational week is like no conference you've ever attended. Go to realestateguysradio.com and click Summit and make plans to spend a week with the Real Estate Guys, Peter Schiff, Ken McElroy, and an all-star faculty on the 19th Annual Investor Summit. Welcome to the Real Estate Guys radio program. I'm your host, Robert Helms. Joining me as usual, it's our co-host, financial strategist, Russell Gray. Hey, Robert. There's so many different topics when it comes to real estate, and today is arguably one of the more important ones, but not necessarily the most exciting one. Even though we've got an exciting guest, we're going to talk to you about today is the legal side of your real estate transactions. When you enter into a purchase contract or a lease or a construction development agreement, those are all legal contracts and they have legal ramifications which means you need legal counsel. And so a lot of folks just hire an attorney and that's one way to go. We're going to give you some suggestions today about how and when and where and what attorneys to hire that I think will help you out. And we've got a great attorney on the program. So yeah, I think that this is really an important topic because for a lot of mom and pop investors or beginning investors, they start out and they're used to a very liberal amount of government regulation and protections. There's all kinds of people looking out for the little guy. So if you're buying a home and you're going through a standard realtor and you're using standard industry contracts and you're using a standard lender, everything is pretty much very tightly regulated and the people hold your hand through the whole process. If anything goes sideways, uh, you're probably not in a whole lot of trouble. I'm not saying you wouldn't want to have an attorney, but a lot of people can buy and sell real estate in their own account for their own purposes all the time without having legal representation. But when you become an investor, when you become a serious investor, when you start to have a serious amount of net worth, when you start trying to be creative, you begin to lose some of those protections. You might deviate and use some non-standard forms, especially when you start getting into commercial type properties. And the point is, is that when you start to play the game at a bigger level, you're going to need to be not only smarter yourself, although you don't have to be an expert, but you have to be smart enough to be able to talk to the experts, which presumes that you have a team of experts on call. One of the first things you want to do is, is start that process early of learning the language, learning who you need to have on the team and starting to build those relationships. And often just one or two key people can lead you to a whole host of other folks that already know how to play well together. Well, and if you spend any time understanding the legal world, there are all kinds kinds of different attorneys. They have to be licensed in a state to do business or internationally, but they do different things. They have different specializations, different areas of expertise. I, I'm not proud to say, but happy to transparently say that we engage more than 20 law firms, and that's because we do a lot of different stuff. Sure, on the radio show, we actually have legal issues because we have trademarks and we have to be careful not to say anything that we're not supposed to, and we don't give advice, as we always tell you during our Ask the Guy show. Uh, we just give you ideas and information. So, hey, you know, we've got marks to protect and intellectual property and so on. That's very different than in our real estate business. When we passively own real estate, that's one level of legal protection we need. Uh, when we are actively involved in a property and negotiation and dealing with third parties, that's another level. So we're going to talk today not only about how to pick an attorney, how to find a good one and those kinds of things, uh, but we're going to interview a gentleman who's been with us for a long time. He was our general counsel. Today, he performs a really cool job for us, Robert and Russ, in that anytime we hire any legal expert, 
and and he's a particular specialist, and we'll talk about what he does when we have him on here in a minute. But anytime we're looking at any attorney, we're much better served when our attorney sits in between us. In other words, we can always call up an attorney out of, off the web and say, oh, I'm looking for this, but much better to have our attorney call because they can cut right through the baloney, they know the right questions to ask, and they're seasoned. So it's all part of building your team, and just like tax professionals do different things, attorneys do different things. Yeah, I think you you mentioned one thing about jurisdictions. And if you're going to be a serious real estate investor, you're probably going to be investing interstate, if not international. And because the attorneys do practice and are licensed in particular areas, you're probably going to need somebody often licensed in the marketplace where the property is, but you're also going to need attorneys where you are. And so, you know, we can talk about who those attorneys are and all that different thing. But the idea is that you're not going to have a singular attorney. You're going to have a team and, you know, you don't have to have them on retainer to the point where you're paying, you know, monthly fees or whatever you, you, you pay them when you need them. Uh, but it's a good idea to have them kind of spec'd out. And to me, you know, you can only have so many quote unquote direct reports. I don't want to have to have 10 different attorneys that I need to call. I want to have one guy that I call who works it out with all the rest of the attorneys. That's kind of the benefit of having a general counsel. And so both on on the front end, trying to find those people and vet them and then build the relationships and then make sure that they are working as a team. So sometimes egos get involved and you know there's differences of opinion. I'm not qualified to get involved in all that minutia, right? If two guys look at something differently, uh, somebody who's qualified to have an opinion is going to need to work it out, give me the bottom line so I can go, okay, this is what I want to do. So it's really good to have somebody there that you know, like, and trust and who knows you and your quirks and what it is you're really trying to accomplish. Uh, And then the other side is once things are actually going, knowing, you know, which attorney to call and uh, to to stay on top of following up and making sure things come back on time and get reviewed. Uh, You know, you should be reading every document that your lawyers draft for you. Sometimes you have time to do that. Sometimes you don't, but it's always good to have one attorney's work double checked by another attorney who can look at it and, oh yeah, we got to make sure that, uh, you know, we put in the right name or the right entity, or we have the right uh, corporate formalities in the signature block or the right uh, deal points are in there, whatever it is. I mean, there's a lot of details in law. And so the point is, is that your legal uh, staff, your legal team, your legal advisor, and how you decide to work with that group uh, is a really important part of your scaling up in your real estate investing business. You know, when you're listening to that and you're hearing, I need one attorney to review another's attorney's work, I know you're thinking, wow, that's going to get expensive. But one of the great things about understanding the way that law firms and law practices work is that if you do it right, and we've figured this out kind of ourselves with a little guidance from our guest today, uh, you don't have to spend the most money. In fact, in a law firm, there is often the most expensive attorney whose name is probably part of the partnership. And then there's all kinds of other attorneys that work there, some of whom charge lesser rates. Many times the work we need done as real estate investors isn't that $600 an hour work. It's more of the $200 or $300 an hour work. And a good legal team manages the players and you need to do the same thing. One of my favorite lessons to teach people is when you hear your attorney say, well, I'm not sure, but let me research that. That's a red flag. That means, well, I don't know, so I'm going to spend your $500 an hour searching and finding out. I would much rather pay someone more who knows the answer than pay someone less who has to go find it out. So it's a big topic. There's a lot to learn. It's not one size fits all, but it's going to be important. And if your plan is to build your real estate portfolio, you're going to have a lot of awesome attorneys in your life. We'll meet one of them when we come back. You're tuned to the Real Estate Guys radio program. I'm your host, Robert Helms. Live nationwide, you're listening to the Real Estate Guys. Find out more at realestateguysradio.com. Hi, this is Brad Sunrock, and over the past 19 years, I've helped thousands of people invest profitably in multifamily real estate. You see, I help people invest in large apartment buildings, both as active syndicators or passive investors. And in today's competitive and changing environment, it's even more important than ever to leverage an experienced mentor, invest in yourself and your ongoing education, and have a team of professional advisors that has nationwide relationships. And with a pandemic, it's even more critical now than ever before that investors understand where and how and what to invest in and what to avoid so that they can be successful. Learn how you can invest in apartments and get ready for the upcoming buying opportunity. Join Brad Sumrock via live stream from anywhere. 
send an email to apartmentmastery at realestateguysradio.com for all the details. Find out where the real opportunities are in multifamily real estate now. Just send an email to apartmentmastery at realestateguysradio.com. Hey, ever wished you could go back in time and do some tax planning? Now you can, just like Marty McFly. Lucky for you, a brand new federal law just made this possible with an EQRP to get tax deductions and reduce your taxable income from last year. So you can use that tax savings to invest in real estate, Bitcoin, gold, even your own business. Whether you're a full-time investor, doctor, government employee, even if you have five or 50 employees, the EQRP works and is your secret weapon. And now it's retroactive. Hey, I'm Damian Lupo and we have your solution. By the way, if you got bad advice and used an IRA for an apartment syndication, you are sitting on a UBIT time bomb. But don't worry, there's a solution, the EQRP. The EQRP company is ready to help you get control of your money, kill UBIT, and help you pay way less taxes. Want to learn more about this strategy? Send an email to EQRP at realestateguysradio.com for my special EQRP report. Paying tax or letting Wall Street suck you dry is dumb. Your first step is freeing your retirement money by sending an email to EQRP at realestateguysradio.com today. Hi, this is Anthony Mocure from Hotel Impossible, and you're listening to The Real Estate Guys. Welcome back to The Real Estate Guys radio program, heard every weekend on this fine radio station all the time at realestateguysradio.com and at all your favorite podcast outlets. We're talking today about the legal protections you need as a real estate investor. And before we're done, we're also going to get a little highlight into a legal update for 2021 because there's some new stuff that has come down the road. In order to help us with that, let's say hello to a returning guest and a good friend of ours, attorney Mauricio Raul. Hey, Mauricio. Hey, Robert. How you guys doing? We are good. In fact, returning from last week, last week you happened to pop in for our Ask the Guys show, which we appreciate, and you answered a question about asset protection. So we're not going to repeat that, but if you're interested in how you own property, should it be an LLC or a trust or your own name, go back in there last week's show. We had a great question from a listener, and Mauricio popped in to help us answer it because it was a legal question. Today, though, Mauricio, you've been part of our legal team for a long time. We've talked about already kind of the things that you perform form within our world. And today, your specialty, and I don't have to be careful when we talk about specialties with attorneys, but the thing you spend time doing is working uh, in the securities field with uh, syndications. But before we go down the syndication path, because we tend to get there on every show, it seems, let's just talk in general about when I discover I need an attorney on my team, how do we figure out what work they need to do and how do I pick a good one? Well, as you guys mentioned earlier, I mean, there's each attorney has their own sort of specialty, right? And so the, the first thing I think you need to, to, to determine is identify what type of attorney you need, which is not easy. It's a lot easier said than done. And that's, I think, going back to having sort of a, a confidant or a general counsel or something like that is very helpful because they'll know immediately what type of attorney you need because on a real estate transaction, and certainly when you're getting to now syndication involving real estate transactions, there's so many different areas of the law and I specialize in a very specific niche. I've got my partner that's the real estate attorney. There's the, all kinds of little things that you've got to worry about. And so that's probably the hardest thing to do. And that's why it's so helpful uh, to at least have, make friends with at least one good, <laughs> good attorney. I know uh, attorneys have a bad uh, reputation sometimes, but having somebody on your team, uh, whether they're a professional or a friend or something that can, that can be your first phone call and say, hey, look, this is my problem. What type of attorney do I need is going to be first your first uncovering or your first due diligence. Uh, because as we mentioned, once you identify that, then the next most important thing is you want to make sure that you're hiring somebody that specializes in that area. You do not want to go to somebody who kind of dabbles in that or does all these other things and maybe they spend 10% of their time on that or 25% of the time. Um, I, as you mentioned, I'm a syndication attorney. I spend 100% of my time on syndication. I don't do anything else. I don't need to go look up anything. I have it all in my head, uh, which allows me to sort of, you know, be a little bit more creative and not worry about whether this is legal or not. We're actually trying to solve problems together, right? But a good attorney should identify and realize when something is outside of their, their scope of competency. And, and I think that's one of the things I tend to do relatively well is I'm, I'm an expert in my particular field and my particular niche. But if something pops up that I'm like, wait a minute, that's a little bit outside my niche. Uh, it sounds like that's potentially a problem but let's go talk to somebody in that area and ask them the question. And I can then kind of coordinate that and, and, and go back and forth with that person. Yeah, and I think that is critical. And, and kind of everything we've talked about up till now is fit under one of the two broad categories of needing an attorney. And they're broad categories, but here they are. The first one is preventative. 
all the things you're going to do to make sure your properties are put in the right kind of entities, everything's protective, you've thought about all the what ifs, if you've got a contract between parties that you've really thought through what could go right, what could go wrong, etc. So preventative. The other big category is once you need to sue someone or be sued. So we'll eventually probably get to that in the conversation. That's a different type of attorney. Some attorneys don't ever litigate anything. They're only on the front end. And I think to my way of thinking, Mariso, and you can chime in here for sure, the more you'll spend on the first part, on the preventative stuff, the less likelihood is that you're gonna need one of those other attorneys. Oh, for sure. I mean, you mentioned something about the hourly rates of attorneys and they, they can get pretty steep sometimes. But if you think of the bigger picture and you realize that that really is almost like an insurance policy, like, yeah, you might spend a little bit of money up front or maybe spend a lot of money up front. But when you compare it to the actual cost of doing it wrong and and, and somebody, especially in my world on the syndication side, if, if some kind of regulatory body like the SEC, the Securities and Exchange Commission, or somebody comes down on you, the cost to not only your finances and your business, but your reputation is so much so much higher than the actual cost on the front end. So I view it as more sort of as an insurance policy. And I'd much rather, even when I'm looking for other attorneys to help my clients, I want to make sure I'm, I'm not necessarily focused too much on, on the price that the attorney is charging. I'm looking for the value and that value comes with the experience. So that's why I want to make sure I've got somebody who just really specializes in that and, I, and I've worked with. And as a general counsel, I'm, I'm constantly looking for new people and, and, and entering into relationships. And so that when a client does say, hey, I've got this problem, I can say, oh, great. Well, I know somebody in your state or I know somebody who does exactly that. Let's let's make a, let's make an introductory call. Well, it's one of the things I loved about your comment about have at least one decent attorney that you know, because they can often be that source of referral, even if they don't know somebody. The function that you often perform for us, we need a specialty attorney. Remember, we needed a DRE attorney. So Department of Real Estate, someone that specializes in the licensing side and all of that. That's a that's a unique specialty. But uh, we found a firm and we had you go in first and, and have the discussion with them. And that, even though it's two attorneys on the clock, it happens quickly because you know what to ask. You know where the problems might be. And that's a, a big role that your attorney can play. But don't think think that you need to, you know, listen to this podcast and go out and hire five law firms. It's not that. Where do you think people start? Well, that's a great question. I mean, it's similar to sort of when you when you you're looking at your health insurance, right? And you and you need to go find a good general practitioner. That's kind of the equivalent of the general counsel. You go see a general practitioner, your doctor, and then from there they'll refer you to a cardiologist or a pulmonologist, whatever it is you need. Again, I think having somebody in your world that is an attorney, again, whether it's a friend or something like that, that's where I would start. Hopefully you have somebody like that in your world. I mean, even if it's a friend or a family member or something, that's gonna be your starting point to again, have some feedback on, on what type of attorneys I really need for my particular situation and then hopefully get some referrals. Or even if they don't have referrals, once you find referrals on your own, run them by this person of confidence that you know, like, and trust and, and see if they've got some feedback one way or the other. Yeah, I love that. I, I think a great way to find anybody to add to your team is a referral. So if you're a real estate investor and you know other investors that are successful, maybe folks that you want to emulate, ask them. Right? They're probably in your same state and so forth. Let's talk about that. Marisa, you're licensed to practice in the state of California where you live and you used to live. And in between, you lived in a bunch of different places. But attorneys are licensed to practice in a jurisdiction. And yet that doesn't mean that they're necessarily limited from doing any type of legal work. It's just that the law does vary from state to state. So imagine I get a great syndication attorney and we're doing a bunch of deals and all of a sudden I get an opportunity to syndicate in another town or another state or another country. How much can my current attorney help and when do they need to bring in help? I'm glad you asked that because it's, it's it's one of the questions I get a lot of times at, the, at our syndication event uh, in that my specialty is securities laws and security is actually a federal body. So I actually practice at the federal level. I don't practice at each individual state, which is why my clients are spread all over the country and actually all over the world. So I can practice in, I don't really practice in all 50 states, but I can represent clients in all 50 states because we're talking about federal securities laws. But there's other items that are more state specific. For example, your real estate attorney, right? The person who's putting together the purchase and sale agreement, the person who's working with the title company, the person who's working with the lender, that typically at some point, has a local attorney involved. Now, the way that we do it at our firm is I've got a real estate attorney and because of the way we do things and we're kind of talking about that here, we actually have an attorney in all 50 states, sort of a local attorney who can at least 
make sure that number one, we get a, a legal opinion from that attorney to make sure that a lot of times the lenders will want a legal opinion. So we want to make sure we have an attorney in that particular state, but also there might be something quirky about that particular state. Uh, so we want to make sure the purchase and sale agreement that kind of all covers that. But we kind of do, again, we kind of play quarterback. Again, clients don't want to have to go hire an attorney in five or 10 different states every time they do a new deal. So having us as kind of the quarterback, we do most of the work and then we coordinate and liaise with local attorneys. But it's very important to make sure that if you're investing in a particular state, that you're aware of that and you have somebody in that state that can help you. Now for a simple transaction, you know, say I go to a real estate broker and they're going to represent me and it's a standard home purchase contract because I'm buying a rental house. That's something that most real estate boards and real estate companies kind of have as their basic agreements. Is that something I need to have an attorney review? If it's a personal residence or something like that, or if it's a single family home or something fairly simple, you can just to make sure you're, you're, you're clean on that. But that's something, it's not typical. Again, most of the contracts, the purchase and sale agreements are in sort of a standard pre-approved from the Department of Real Estate in that particular state. But once you scale a little bit and you start now getting into maybe commercial buildings, anything that's above five units, now that gets a little bit more complicated with the loan. Now you're talking with a commercial loan. And certainly the minute you start accepting other people's money and having that responsibility of, of being the steward of those of that money, then you absolutely should be having a real estate attorney making sure you're covered, not only for the protection of your investors, but also for your purposes. I mean, the last thing you want to do is go in and, and use somebody else's money, buy a piece of property and then find out, oh my God, it, it had some environmental uh, issue or it had an easement on there that I didn't know about, or I, it's got some title problems or whatever. Now you're going to be responsible for those investors because a reasonable, prudent person would have had hired an attorney and wouldn't have tried to save a couple grand, uh, which by the way, comes out of the project anyway, wouldn't have tried to save that money just to save a couple thousand dollars. And so for your own protection at that point, you definitely want to have a, a real estate attorney involved. But if it's for your own account, you can then, you know, you can determine the risk reward that you're comfortable with. But the smaller the deal, the less likely you're going to need a a real estate attorney involved in that particular state. One of the places you definitely need an attorney is when you are having something drafted, meaning it's a unique set of circumstances, like I'm forming a partnership or joint venture, or it's a development contract and there's leases and sales commissions and all kinds of things involved. And then you're creating documents from scratch. That's kind of a, a specialty, but there's also, you know, kind of that in between, you mentioned loans. I can remember the first time we had to bring in an attorney to look at our loan documents because we were borrowing some money for a development project. And it was kind of a lot of money, at least it seemed like it to us back then. And we didn't know the first thing about these types of mortgage documents. I had bought several houses and always read through the documents and thought, I understand all this. All of a sudden, here comes 80 something pages written by the lender's attorney directly for this transaction. Well, there was a case where we absolutely needed somebody on our side going through and letting us know well, the pros and cons of us signing it or any changes that they would recommend. Yeah, I mean, in those situations, it's it's probably unlikely that you're going to get too much uh, wiggle room to make any changes, but at least somebody can review and say, yeah, go or no go. Or, or as, as look, as Russ likes to say all the time, the role of the attorney is really to give you the options. You're the entrepreneur, you're the decision maker. Uh, an attorney needs to tell you what the pros, like you said, the pros and cons of that particular document or that particular legal issue. And then you, based on that information, need to make a sort of a, a business decision based on, based on those facts that you're given. Certainly when you get to the commercial world, um, not only reviewing the contract, but also just dealing with all the requests that the lender is going to have of you. You know, they're going to require all these closing documents that you need to put together. So having an attorney uh, a real estate attorney specifically in that situation is, is, is what you want to have. But as you mentioned, when you're drafting contracts, maybe it's because you have a property management company that you're hiring. And so you want to draft a contract with a, a property management company. One thing I will tell you on the co drafting of contracts, because this, this has come up a lot. And I think with the expense, always people are concerned about the expense. It's a lot cheaper to have your attorney draft the document from scratch than it is for that attorney to review somebody else's attorney, the other side's attorney's contract uh, and make changes and make sure that's fine. It's just going to take them a lot less time because they've, they, they're they starting with their own templates that they've developed over sometimes decades and they're, they know the document inside and out. And so now they're just tailoring the document to the particular situation. When they get somebody else's document, 
they're going to have to go line by line. And, and it's just going to take sometimes two or three times longer, which just means two or three times more expensive. I love that bit, bit of advice. We've uh, used that one from you uh, several times when you're at the end of the first meeting. And it's like, well, do you guys want to take a shot at the agreement or do we? You're like nudging me. Yeah, like we want to do that. Yeah, we want to start with that and then have them review it. Now, there's other times that you would use an attorney to review work and so forth. But as a real estate investor, as you evolve, if you start to become, say, involved in a specialty, we have listeners that do assisted living or they do agriculture, then there's just that next level of understanding. And so we won't go down that rabbit trail so much, but just keep it in mind, as you evolve as a real estate investor, you're going to bring different people in on your team. And as you mentioned, Marie, so a good attorney is going to know when to say no. You know when it's not, when you're not the right person. The great attorney will then help you find that right person. Let's talk about for a minute what happens when you do get into trouble. Our friend, our mutual friend, and also an attorney, Garrett Sutton, always asks crowds of people when he speaks, raise your hand if you've been sued and raise your hand if you've not been sued yet. So if you get to the point where you've been sued or you feel like you need to go out and, and sue somebody and claim, talk about hiring that kind of attorney because when we met you, you actually were more on the litigation side. Yeah, when I started, I started as a securities defense attorney. So my job was to defend a lot of these big brokerage houses, sort of the JP Morgans and Merrill Lynch's of the world. Uh, and so my involvement started when things already went bad and there was already a lawsuit filed. And that's the first thing that would come on my desk was the lawsuit. And then it was my job to respond and, and start the litigation process of depositions and motions and court appearances and trials and appellates and all that stuff. Uh, that is a completely different world. You can almost, as you mentioned, put a line between and say everything before the lawsuit or the threat of a lawsuit happens. That's sort of the transactional stuff, which is now what I focus on, you know, preventing people from getting into that problem. But once that line is crossed or that you fear that that line's about to get crossed, now we need to go find really a litigator. Also, depending on whether you're the one being sued or the one thinking about suing, those are also two different things. There are people who specialize in suing. They're plaintiff's lawyers. They represent people suing. Uh, and then there's other people who are defense attorneys that specialize in defense, defending people. And in my world, there are people who specifically specialize in defending securities work. So if you're a syndicator and you have a, you receive a letter from a regulator, whether it's the SEC or your state or corporation department or securities division, that's a specialty in and of itself. So we, we've now made several contacts and I've probably got now three or four people in my world that if that were to happen, I would make a referral and introduction to one of these three or four people. And then obviously have the client with my assistant, you know, pick the right person. But that would definitely not be me. That would definitely not be the real estate attorney. That would be something that specializes. And I do recommend, again, finding somebody who specializes in that field. Uh, like I said, when I was doing litigation, I was a securities a litigator. So that's what I knew. If you came with me for a slip and fall and, you know, somebody got into a car accident, that I, I wouldn't be the person to help you there. There's people who specialize in auto injury. So there's, there's all these different specialties. We're talking with attorney Marisa Old about the role an attorney plays in your ongoing real estate business. We'll talk about syndication, his specialty, and also some of the legal updates everyone needs to know for 2021. When we come back, we'll also play real estate trivia next. You're tuned to the Real Estate Guys radio program. I'm your host, Robert Helms. Need help with your real estate investment portfolio? Check out the resources page at realestateguysradio.com. When it comes to successful rental property investing, it pays to be picky. Pick the right markets, pick profitable properties, and pick great property management. That's easier said than done, but we've got great news. Jerry Curran and his rock star team at Mid-South Home Buyers are going strong in Memphis, Tennessee, and Little Rock, Arkansas, too. So for a top-notch turnkey single-family home rental property, whether you're a new investor or have a large portfolio already, pick Terry Kerr and Mid-South for a truly A-plus investing experience. To learn more, send an email to midsouth at realestateguysradio.com. That's midsouth at realestateguysradio.com. For thousands of years of human history, silver has been recognized as money. Then in 1965, the United States took silver out of the financial system. But did silver stop being money? Smart investors don't think so. And ever since, when there are concerns about the quality of the currency, alert investors seek shelter in silver and gold. As the size and frequency of major financial crises grow, silver is attracting a lot of attention. To help better understand the what, why, and how of silver, watch the free nine-part series, Making Sense of Silver, Everything You Always Wanted to Know About Silver But Didn't Know to Ask, featuring 30-year precious metals veteran Dana Samuelson. 
Send your email request to silverseries at realestateguysradio.com. Whether you own silver now or you're wondering if it's too late, email silverseries at realestateguysradio.com. Hi, I'm Nomi Prinz, author of Collusion. You're listening to The Real Estate Guys. Welcome back to The Real Estate Guys radio program. Thanks for tuning into the show. You just have a few days left to get signed up for the secrets of successful syndication. Our two-day event on putting together bigger deals or investing passively in them. You can get all the details on the website of realestateguysradio.com. We're talking with attorney Mauricio Raul. And before we get back to that interview, it's time to play real estate trivia. In just a moment, I'm going to ask you a question that has something to do with real estate. In fact, with law. As soon as you hear the question and think you know the answer, send your best guess to trivia at realestateguysradio.com. You want to send us your name, the answer to the question, and your mailing address. Because if you're the first to get it right, you're going to get a really cool book called Don't Quit, Stories of Persistence, Courage, and Faith. Lots of great folks in this book, including Maurice Arul, who has a chapter in the book. That could be yours if you know today's real estate trivia question. Last week on the program, it was Ask the Guys, We Asked You This, to which you have state that the most people move in 2020. Well, according to data compiled by U-Haul, it was Tennessee. The moving equipment rental company recently released its 2020 migration trends report, ranking all 50 states in terms of migration growth based on the net gain of one-way U-Haul trucks entering a state versus leaving that state in a calendar year, something we've talked about for a long time. Of the more than 2 million U-Haul vehicle transactions that occurred in 2020, it seems the most one-way trips ended in the great state of Tennessee. Here's our real estate trivia question. With an attorney on the program, we thought we'd ask this, in which U.S. state is it a law that pickles must bounce? Yeah, in one of the 50 states in the U.S., it's a law that pickles have to bounce. In fact, they have to bounce when dropped from the height of one foot. That's the regulation. In what state does it exist? Can't make this stuff up. If you know or want to guess, or who knows, maybe you live there and are in the habit of bouncing your pickles, send your best guess to trivia at realestateguysradio.com. Include your name and mailing address, because if you're the winner, you get Don't Quit, stories of persistence, courage, and faith. That's today's real estate trivia question. Speaking of law, we're talking with Mauricio Raul, uh, our good friend and attorney, who uh, helps keep us out of trouble. And that's one of the main roles of your attorney, to keep you out of trouble. And then if you have to defend yourself, well, that's the road we were talking about there before. But Mauricio, let's transition to your specialty, syndication. Uh, you mentioned this before, but it's so critical. If I'm just investing in my own account, and lots of our listeners do that. They buy houses, they buy apartment buildings, they buy real estate in their own account. It's just theirs, their families. And then many of them run out of their own money and their own ability to qualify. And they find uh, what we think is almost the holy grail in real estate syndication. If I still have deal flow and I still have vendors and team members and markets, but I'm out of capital, I can go raise the money. And you step over this line when you go from just investing in your own account to raising capital. That's what you help people do. Talk about the power of syndication and what the legal protections involved are. Well, the power is is, is obviously immense in, in that whatever limitations you think you may have in the real estate world with how much money you may have or how much credit you may have or whatever the other resources at, those all go away with syndication because there is, as we mentioned in, our, in the event, uh, there's unlimited money out there uh, there's unlimited credit. Um, if you've got the resourcefulness to, to do it, you'll find the resources. And so there's really no limit to how much money you can make, how many people you can help, how many properties you can buy, what jurisdictions, countries. I mean, it's your sort of it, the world becomes your, your oyster with syndication. The challenge is, of course, with that awesome appeal, there's a, a tremendous amount of responsibility, just not even from the legal side, but just from a, from a value standpoint. You're taking people's hard earned money that they've spent sometimes a lifetime accumulating and they're entrusting you with that money and it's your job to make sure you're an excellent steward of that money and put it to work and, and treat it way better than how you would treat your own money most likely, right? Uh, you, you may have some risk tolerance, you know, I've got a really high risk tolerance and there's things that I would do that I would never bring people along because unless they were very explicit, they were in that same category, but everybody has different risk tolerances. And so uh, you just got to be aware of that. And then, of course, the legal requirements that you have to be aware of. And this is probably one of the biggest mistakes or biggest issues that I see with new syndicators or not even syndicators, new people who are trying to scale and now bringing in partners or other people's money is 
not understanding that when you're raising capital from, from other people, you are generally engaging in the practice of issuing securities. And people don't think of that. People just think, oh, I'm trying to buy this property and I got a couple of my buddies and let's just, you know, you give me the money and, I'm, and I'll use that for the down payment and I'll do all the work. It's not really, I'm not selling securities. I'm just buying a piece of property. But as we know, and we talk about all the time is that anytime you take money from people where the returns are generated by your efforts, you're doing all the work and the, uh, the individual is just handing you a check and, and, and just going home, that's a security, and that's why that's why the SEC is involved. That's why I have a job. That's why you know we have to comply with both federal and state securities laws. And and the amount of calls that I have with people, you know, thinking that because of the way they structure something, or because it's only one person, or you know, because they want to call it a joint venture, or they come up with all these, I don't want to say excuses, but but justifications as to to why it's not a security. Um, I have to give them bad news. And a lot of times so many people don't even know. I mean, why would you know? If you're just buying, if you're used to buying real estate and now you want to bring on a couple of your buddies or people that you know or coworkers and, and, and we're going to pool our resources and I'm going to go buy a piece of property, why is the SEC in my face? Like why, that doesn't, that's not a natural progression if you've never dealt with it. So that's what I'm trying to educate folks uh, with my content is just letting people know that they are in fact issuing securities, which is why we have to, you need, again, you just need to be aware that that's a possibility so you can at least talk to somebody and say, hey, is what I'm doing a security or is this what I'm doing just doing a joint venture or putting a business together? Well, and to me, it's kind of the analogy of knowing enough about your car so that you can talk intelligently to a mechanic, not, not enough so you can replace the engine, right? But so you kind of understand how it works. I think folks that are either going to passively invest in a syndication or become syndicators who are putting together these types of deals, they don't need to be able to craft their own private placement memorandum documentation. They need to know enough about the law and requirements that they can pick the right attorney and help that person guide them. And one of the interesting things, Mauricio, that I think is a subtlety is that the work that you do doesn't just protect the syndicator. These documents are designed to protect both parties, the passive investor, as well as the person who's rolling up their sleeves and doing the work. Yeah, I mean, I, I obviously represent the syndicator, but the way I represent the syndicator is by making sure that the passive investors are protected and have all the information and all the disclosures about the risks of this particular project. And so it, it's kind of a double-edged shield, so to speak. So on the one hand, we're protecting the passive investors because we're giving them all the information. If they've got any doubts, here's all the all the great things about the project, but here are also the bad things about the project. But on the front, on the flip side, because we're putting together these disclosure documents, it makes it really difficult for an investor to somehow complain if something doesn't go according to plan, because we can always point to somewhere in the in the documents that, hey, we mentioned this. This was a this was a possibility that you know the market may turn or whatever the circumstances were, and and we can literally point to a page number in our documents and say, look, I told you that this was a particular risk, and you know, unfortunately, it happened. And and as long as we've disclosed everything, we, we should be okay, even if you know, even if things you know, people lose money all the time, but it doesn't necessarily mean it was your fault. Now we joke and we call you the anti-lawyer because so many lawyers have this reputation of being deal killers, and you're the opposite of that. You're encouraging of investors. You help educate investors. You want them to do the deal. You just want them to be smart and careful and prudent about it. And if you're interested in syndication, we think it is absolutely the best opportunity for real estate there is. Most uh, investors run out of their own capital and credit at some point, And the next logical step is to raise money. Marisa will be one of our featured guests at the upcoming Secrets of Successful Syndication. It happens at the end of this month. And you've got to hurry because more than 220 people are already signed up. We'll make room for you if you're quick. You can find out all the details on our website at Real Estate Guys Radio. Radio.com under events. But let's talk about some of the new changes, Marie. So this is a evolution for sure. We are seeing lots of changes over the last several years with regard to syndication, raising money, placing money, etc. And we're not going to have time to get into all the changes, but hit the high notes for us. Tell us what uh, some of the changes everyone needs to know about for 2021 are. Yeah, I'm really excited about sort of adding this section to, to the event uh, because for for some reason, I'm not sure why, but there, there were a lot of updates that have happened over the last 12 to 18 months. I mean, there's always updates, but they're not necessarily relevant or they're not very excited. But in this particular case, I think we've got several that are really impactful for the syndicator and also for the passive investors as well. 
Uh, probably the most prominent one out there so far is this uh, expansion of the accredited investor definition. As you'll find out in the event, you know, some, some of the exemptions that we look for uh, will, will limit you to only having accredited investors in your deal, meaning people who have a million dollars in net worth or just kind of high net worth individuals. This new rule is actually starting to expand that definition, which means there's going to be more and more people that are going to be available in that pool of, of investors who are going to be accredited. Uh, and it's going to be, you know, instead of being, where, which it is now, based on purely on financial uh, net worth or income requirements, which uh, we've always complained about because we all know people who are super smart uh, and aren't, don't have that much money. And we know people who are very high net worth individuals and they're the dumbest people in the room. Right. So judging an accredited investor by the amount of money they have or net worth doesn't necessarily make a good uh, definition. So the SEC has kind of recognized that. And so now there's a process that's underway where you can actually go through an accreditation process where you can take some courses, get certified as an accredited investor, and then become an accredited investor, even though you don't have the net worth or liquidity requirement. So on the one hand, that's exciting for a passive investor, you know, who wants to invest in some of these really exciting opportunities, but are not allowed to because they're not accredited. Well, now they've got a path to where they can become an accredited investor through taking a course and taking an exam and becoming certified. And then from a, from a syndicator standpoint, obviously that's exciting because now there's just more credit, the pool of accredited investors, potential accredited investors is just gonna grow and grow and grow. And it gets to the point where if they have already a relationship with someone who's not accredited, you can point them in the right direction and say, hey, if you really wanna invest in this deal, why don't you go through this accreditation process and get certified and then come back to me and we can then have you in our deal. So that's a kind of a big deal. That is a big deal. It, it's crazy because it totally makes sense. The very reason there is a distinction between accreditation and not is that the government wants to be sure that people have kind of earned the right to be able to make these investment decisions. And the theory is if you make a bunch of money or have a lot of assets, then you can make these decisions. If you don't do those things, you're not smart enough to make your own decisions. Well, here's a way that people can raise their hand and say, no, 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 I want to be sophisticated. I want to understand. I want to put the work in and be tested on it. So that's awesome. Also, aren't there some changes regarding other license holders? Yeah. So right. This is a, again, it's always fluid, right? So right now we don't have the final sort of certification programs in place yet, but the ones that are in place are people who have what we call investment advisory licenses. So if you have a series seven or a Series 65 or a Series 82 license, you are now an accredited investor. And if you wanna go take, I think Series 82 or maybe 65 or 82 is probably the easiest one to get, but you can now go now, tomorrow, Google uh, and find out how to become and how to obtain a Series you know, 65 license. Then you can go take the exam, uh, study, take the exam, pay the fees or whatever, and you would become a, a Series 65 license holder, which would now make you an accredited investor. Uh, what the other ones look like are coming down the pipeline, and hopefully by the time we do the event, we'll, we'll have some more guidance from the SEC, but there are already some in place already. All right. Well, that's a good update. There are a couple more things. In fact, Marisa's putting together a report that uh, should be out any second uh, about the three biggest legal changes for 2021. If you'd like to get a copy of that report, just send an email to big 3 at realestateguysradio.com, B-I-G and the number three, big three at realestateguysradio.com, and you'll get that report. Hey, before you're out of here, in addition to joining us at the syndication event, which you always do, we're thrilled that you're coming back with us for the 19th annual Investor Summit. This time, the Summit on Sand in beautiful Belize, a place you know well. Mauricio does a couple of things here. He certainly has a grand time talking with syndicators, passive investors, all those kinds of folks. But you also do an introductory course, which is basically a morning that you're going to spend with people so they can understand some of the basics. And most folks that attend the summit are fairly sophisticated. It's a lot of time and a lot of money, and you've been a bunch of times, so you know the types of people that come. But we have the spouses or the partners partners sometimes that don't understand that much. So I really appreciate the fact that you'll take time and do that. Uh, we're uh, excited about the summit. Give us your take on the Investor Summit. You've been more years than you haven't. I've, I've lost track now. I think I'm on, this will be my, I don't want to make it up, but I want it's definitely over 10. So I don't know if this is my 11th or 12th, or maybe it's a 10th. I've lost track, honestly. We've been going back since we met 15, 16 years ago. So I haven't gone every year. Um, I've had a family along the way, so sometimes I've missed it. But super excited. The caliber of people that come to this event is just outstanding. And, and spending a week or sometimes 10 days 
with like-minded people uh, is always a reward for me. And, and it's just, it's just, it's such an amazing event. And, and especially when you, you, you come back, right. You, so you, you, you have the 10 days, you make some lifelong friends. And now when, you know, you, you see people afterwards at our events, it's just going to be, you're just going to feel like family. And so I'm super excited going back to Belize where I spent a couple of years uh, living and I uh, just can't wait. Good stuff. Well, if you want to hang out with Mauricio Raul, either come to the Investor Summit or the Secrets of Successful Syndication or what the heck, why not both? And if you're interested in that report, just send an email to big3 at realestateguysradio.com. We mentioned it last week and you probably should go back and hear that show. But if you haven't and you're interested in the basics of asset protection, um, Mauricio has a great report on the basics of asset protection in real estate. Just send an email to CYA. Cover your assets, CYA at realestateguysradio.com. Risu, as always, thanks for sharing your wisdom with us, and we'll see you at the end of the month. Oh, thanks for having me. Always great to be on, and uh, looking forward to seeing you guys. There's attorney Mauricio Raul. More when we come back. You're tuned to the Real Estate Guys radio program. I'm your host, Robert Helms. Real estate investment advice right in your mailbox. Sign up for the free Real Estate Guys newsletter at realestateguysradio.com. If you love real estate and have always wanted to own your own business, listen up. The Real Estate Guys and their panel of experts want to teach you how to go full-time fast in the real estate syndication business. These next few years may go down in history as one of the best times ever to acquire investment real estate. There are deals everywhere if you know where to look and how to assemble the resources. The Secrets of Successful Syndication Seminar will show you how to make big money doing big deals from a team of experts that have syndicated projects totaling more than $1 billion. Don't wait for someone to give you a raise or create a job for you. Attend the secrets of successful syndication and learn how to build a team, raise capital, find deals, and make full-time money in six months or less. Go to realestateguysradio.com and click on events. All the big players use syndication as a way to diversify risk, optimize profits, and earn big money. You can too. Go to realestateguysradio.com and click on events. Are you ready to profit in paradise? Hi, it's Robert Helms. And if you think real estate investing means tenants, toilets, and termites, think again. Located just a short plane ride from the U.S., a virtually untouched paradise awaits. The beautiful country of Belize. When you go to Belize with the Real Estate Guys, you'll spend four fabulous days discovering one of the most intriguing real estate markets I've ever seen. With its jungle rainforests, pristine beaches, and 81-degree turquoise water, Belize is one of the most beautiful places on Earth. Plus, it's considered one of the top seven tax havens in the world. Belize property is on the rise and many experts think the best is yet to come but don't just take my word for it come experience belize firsthand at our upcoming investor field trip when you join us you'll discover the many reasons we love belize like tremendously undervalued beachfront land super low taxes ease of doing business and so much more get the details at realestateguysradio.com just click on events see paradise for yourself click events at realestateguysradio.com and i'll see you in beautiful belize Hi, this is Tom Wheelwright, best-selling author of Tax Free Wealth, and you're listening to Real Estate Guys Radio. Welcome back to the Real Estate Guys Radio Show. We're so glad you've tuned in. Tell a friend about the Real Estate Guys, and it's great you're still listening. Sometimes we talk about things like the legal side of real estate and people tune out, but I learned a ton today from Marisa Raul. Absolutely. You have to have somebody in your life that you can go to to get candid conversations about these types of issues especially when you're new, because when you're new, you don't even know what you don't know. And you often do things thinking that the law is common sense. It's not. You think that it's fair. It's not. And often it's laced with landmines that you're not even aware of. And so again, if you're, you know, as we said at the top of the show, if you're out there and you're doing business in kind of the safe lane uh, with the training wheels on where you're, you're residential one to four and you've got all these uh, consumer protections there, but the minute you step into the big leagues, you are going to want to have professionals around you and having that somebody that actually speaks English. That's one of the things I like about Mauricio. He, he doesn't try to impress you with how smart he is or how much he knows. He doesn't throw around a bunch of legal mumbo jumbo. Uh, he's not positioning anything. He's just very, very candid. 
And if you can find an attorney that you can have that kind of relationship with, that's a great foundation. That's why we hired him to start with. You know, he was in our uh, investor mentoring club way back in the day, read Rich Dad, Poor Dad, and wanted to become a real estate investor. He was a young attorney. He was uh, in the E quadrant as an employee working for a law firm, realized quickly after reading Rich Dad, Poor Dad, if you're familiar with it, in the cash flow quadrant, that he wanted to get to the other side, to the B and the I. And he started out really, I think, on the I, becoming an investor, and then uh, and then eventually branched off and created his law firm, uh, and then you know kind of bounced along as a sole proprietor there for a little while, a one man band. But then as the syndication mentoring program grew and and all of that, and uh, he really embraced his specialty of of syndication practice. Uh, that that's where he started to scale up, and so it's really been fun to see him blossom uh, as an investor, to see him blossom as a business person, and also just to have this lifelong friendship with him as our attorney, somebody that we can talk to. And I think if you can find a way to build that with somebody in your life, uh, it's a great investment in a relationship. Well, you mentioned the languaging because legal language does matter. And some attorneys speak it all the time, but but he doesn't. Uh, in addition to speaking English, he also speaks Spanish. He's represented us in uh, Spanish-speaking countries and real estate contracts. And again, not being the attorney, but helping us navigate the legal side. And that's really more of a strategic way of thinking. It's not, oh, I need an attorney to do this. You've got to stop and think. You know, one of the things that uh, I learned from you, Russ, was this idea of even though it's expensive, getting your attorney and say your tax professional and your broker on the same call at the same time actually can save you a ton of money. Oh, absolutely. Because, you know, if you end up trying to be the go-between, something is going to get lost in the translation. And it takes them time to kind of ramp up and get their mind around the conversation that you had with the other one, whoever, the one you were talking with. Uh, and by the time you go through all that, you've paid a lot more. If you just will get them on the phone and let them brainstorm on the problem in real time with you there as the mediator, ultimately you have to make the decision, but you don't have to have any of the technical experience. And the thing that you'll find as you get deeper into this, uh, and this is especially true when you move into things like asset protection, estate planning, which are kind of two sides of the entity structuring concept, but then there's the tax side of things. And then you have your privacy, which is a little bit different than asset protection, but an important part of it, especially depending on the type of business you're doing or like us, you know, because we're mini media people, you know, we like to have our privacy. Or if you get involved in something a little bit more complicated, like international, you know, back in the day when we decided, hey, maybe it would be a good idea to have a plan B after going through the financial crisis and we planted our flag in Belize, you know, having somebody that knows how to do all that. So there, there's a lot going on. And Nobody is going to have their mind around it all by themselves. And so doing a mind meld where you get all the people who need to be a part of the problem solving to do what is really a tax legal mastermind and just bang it out, get it done, get consensus with you being the judge of what your priorities are. I'm, I'm more interested in tax savings. No, I'm more interested in asset protection. No, I'm more interested in privacy. No, I'm more interested in low cost of administration, right? There is no perfect one size fits all solution. You're going to have to balance those competing sometimes agendas uh, into something that is a compromise that will work best for you in your particular situation. The fastest way to do that is get them all on the phone together. And that's why it's really important that the team knows how to play nice with each other. Real estate investing is a team sport. So we talked about legal today, but that's certainly not the only part of your team. So as you continue to expand your real estate holdings, you continue to not only expand your team members, but also to kind of up the ante. It may be that you have a tax professional that served you well owning 10 single family houses. As soon as you start owning shopping centers and bowling alleys and syndications, now you need a different attorney. So don't be afraid to change you know, team members when you need to, right? Professional sports teams, do all this all the time, but it also is a great opportunity for you to grow. And if you hang around great people, you'll get great results. You know, one of the things I learned from one of our mutual partners, uh, Russ, is when you hire the best, it actually doesn't cost you more. It makes you money. And that is absolutely the truth when you hire a great attorney. If you want uh, the updates that Mauricio is going to summarize for you on the changes in the law this year, big three. B-I-G and the number three at realestateguysradio.com. And if you're interested in that basics of asset protection, it's a video he recorded some time ago, but it's still perfectly valid. Just send an email to CYA 
at realestateguysradio.com. we got a great show for you next week. Until then, go out and make some equity happen. This episode of the Real Estate Guys Radio Show is brought to you by Paradigm Life. Powerful cash management strategies using life insurance. Learn more at beyourbank.com. Mid-South Home Buyers, low-cost, turnkey cash flow properties in Memphis, Tennessee. Corporate Direct, asset protection strategies for real estate investors from attorney and rich dad advisor Garrett Sutton. Find these and other great companies under the Resources tab at realestateguysradio.com. To learn how you can expose your product or service to the Real Estate Guys audience, call 888-489-7723, extension 4. That's 888-489-7723, extension 4. Or use the feedback page at realestateguysradio.com. Thanks for listening, and we'll see you next week right here on the Real Estate Guys Radio Show.